Hello again, agents. The files we will unveil in this entry reveal information about a mysterious group of interest and an anomalous entity at the same time. The self-proclaimed Cinco Symphony. Its relationship with other anomalous entities only deepens the mystery surrounding this intricate phenomena. Nevertheless, certain questions can only be answered by untangling the intricate web of our memories. Rows upon rows of empty seats line the hall. You've made sure only you're here tonight. The others are all off on business, or caught up in their work. You made sure to register a week's holiday after the business down in Magalu. Your sheer exhaustion needs to be tended to. In the few months since your promotion, you haven't had much time to yourself. But there have been things you've been curious about for a long time. Things beyond your particular remit. You've made a requisition request for a file, stuck in a filing cabinet in one of the more obscure parts of Site-01. It's pretty clear that it's something most people would like to forget. The reel begins to play. All automated, of course. Grains flicker across the screen, before boosting into an image. It's a high school playing field. The year must be about 1975-76. There's no audio and the image flickers and distorts at inconvenient moments. But the forms are all clear. They're playing rugby, American football, something like that. It's not quite right. The camera stretches and moves around. A smiling group of people, spectators, all wave at the camera. Their movements are not constructed, or active, or precise. They're messy and uncertain, giggling and youthful. People. Real people, sitting right in front of you, right? You look down at the document, but you can't quite concentrate. You remember school, don't you? Your experience was different, different place, different time, but you remember it. The disciplined format of time, the early pangs of heartache, the promise of all your dreams before you, an infinity of youth shaped by your name. It was all ahead of you, that sunset curve over the horizon. You do remember, right? Don't you remember? Item number SCP-4833, Object Class, Gather. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-4833 activity is currently being monitored by MTF ETA-11, Savage Beasts. ETA-11 will immediately respond to any reported incidents, assert that the situation and attempt to contain any potential anomalies. Following incident 4833-8C, the nature of SCP-4833 is considered to be radically altered. SCP-4833 will be reclassified and its file altered as soon as Agent O'Hara's debriefing has concluded. Description: SCP-4833 is an organized group of reality vendors, originally going by the name Cinco Symphony. SCP-4833 is believed to contain between 10 and 29 individuals, all of whom exhibit similar abilities and properties. Beginning in the late 1940s, the group's primary activity has been experimentation on youths between 15 and 18 in age, with the intention of anomalously altering them for unknown purposes. SCP-4833 was once a significant player in anomalous affairs, being particularly feared within the anomalous underworld for the kidnapping and forcible alteration of numerous individuals since the late 1940s. However, their presence has significantly decreased in recent years. Beyond this, very little is known of SCP-4833's purpose, modus operandi, or fundamental nature. They have only been encountered indirectly by Foundation agents through events 4833 has orchestrated. Testimonies from several survivors indicate that SCP-4833's ultimate goal is the institution of a state of harmony. What this entails is unknown. SCP-4833's anomalous properties seem to center around memory and music. In most of the forms in which the Foundation have encountered them, they appear either as a performing orchestra or as a musical supply shop. Sightings of SCP-4833 members invariably mention that they are masked. However, due to the amnesty defects all such individuals have suffered, Further details are unclear. SCP-4833 was first brought to the Foundation's attention in the mid-1970s. 
a dedicated Foundation Task Force was established shortly after, with the express purpose of investigating and tracking down SCP-4833. Although this task force has not succeeded in tracking down any member of SCP-4833 to date, they have been provided a great deal of information, which has aided in containing SCP-4833's activity on a wider scale. Timeline of SCP-4833 1947 Believed to be the beginning of SCP-4833's activities. Subjects begin to be kidnapped worldwide, with a particular concentration in the vicinity of Yellowstone National Park. 1964 First mass experimentation, taking place in Boise, Idaho. Due to the pressure from the GOC and various other organizations, SCP-4833 is believed to have relocated its primary base of operations to County 1969 SCP-4833 opens a musical supply shop known as Syncope Symphony in the town of No anomalous activity initially present Autumn 1975 Mass cognitohazardous event taking place at Lake Although no conclusive evidence linking this to SCP-4833 has been found, the nature of the anomaly fits SCP-4833's modus operandi. 1976 Series of experiments performed by SCP-4833 at Kirk Longwood High School and High School. The schools and towns in question were swiftly evacuated and foundation control was enforced. The Syncope Symphony Musical Supply Shop was found abandoned upon a foundation raid. 1977 The number of subjects kidnapped by SCP-4833 sharply decreases when compared to 1976, beginning a trend which has continued to the present. Figures in the anomalous underground have speculated that this is due to SCP-4833 achieving its goals at some point in 1976, with further kidnapping simply being a way of fine-tuning. 1988 Last known encounter between Foundation personnel and an individual altered by SCP-4833 prior to 2019. 2019 Incident 4833-8C See below Addendum 4833-1 Interview Log The following is a log of Agent John Hardcastle's interaction with an anomalous reality vendor. Date September 11, 1988 Location Tractic Nasavity, a bar in Arkhangelsk, Soviet Union. Notes Agent Harkasol had spent several months researching the earliest records of SCP 4833's experiments. He had come across records indicating that only Vasily Stroganov, an individual known to Agent Harkasol, had been the subject of SCP 4833 experiments in the late 1940s. Mr. Stroganov was tracked down to Arkhangelsk and interviewed alone by Agent Hardcastle. Begin, though. Agent Hardcastle activates his camera. He is in a white, deserted alleyway. It is snowing heavily. A sign can be seen saying, Tractor, Russian for tavern. He moves towards the doorway and enters. The interior is dark and dirty. The walls are undecorated brick, and a few tables are scattered around the place. The bartender is an overweight, middle-aged man, who is clearly inebriated. Another man, Vasily Stroganov, is lumped over a glass of vodka. There is nobody else in the establishment. Vodka, please. The bartender fetches a glass of vodka. As he does so, Stroganov sits upright and stares at Agent Hardcastle, who nods at him. The bartender gives the drink to Agent Hardcastle. Much custom this time of year? Ah, uh, Faith, you American? English, but don't worry, I'm one of the good ones. There are no good Englishmen, but there are no good Russians either. Agent Hardcastle hands the bartender a thick wad of rubble notes. Here's a little tip for some uh, privacy. The bartender looked through the money, nods, and shuffled into the back room. Agent Harkasol puts up a seat next to Stroganov. Hello, Vasily. It's been a while, hasn't it? Please, just leave me alone. You promised to leave me alone. After Buddha, 
after I saved. I'm sorry, Vasily. I really am. I didn't want to be here, but there is something bigger than you or I going on. I'm an old man, John. I can't help you. I live in an apartment in a concrete building nobody cares about, watching the snow go past. I don't even have heating. The Empire as I used to. Strogandov shakes his head and does not speak for several seconds. Just go away. I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. I need you to tell me about Cinco, Vasily. Stroganov visibly tenses. No, 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 no. Go away, John. You don't know what you're dealing with. Children, Vasily. Just like you were. I need to know what happened in 1954. No, I can't. Please, I can't. We can take you in. Set you up somewhere nicer. Somewhere? It doesn't matter where you set me up. It's all the same. Stroganov takes a large swing of vodka. Have you been here long? What do you think of this city? That's not... It's fine, I guess. Same as any other Soviet city I've been to. Big, filled with concrete, another cold and obscure Russian town. This town doesn't feel obscure to its residents. It's the biggest city for hundreds of miles. But for a man in the West, a man looking at the map of the world, it seems like the farthest outpost of civilization. Everything you think anchors you is just a minute island washing through an endless sea. There's always another design, bigger than the last. That's what they told me. And they'll find me, John. I can't tell you anything. You've already helped me, Vasily. They believe in a design bigger than the last. That's enough. Come on, we can keep you comfortable, safe. You can tell me all about what those powers are that you never wanted to reveal to me. It's not like the old days. We're kinder now, gentler. This place will be obscure too. This time, this place, that footage on your camera, the 1980s. What will people think of it? A glorious decade. For some. For others, I think it'll be remembered as a dark place. Cold and full of uncertainty, like wading through a lake at night. All the more reason to improve the world, then. And we can start with Cinco. But they're barely even a player anymore. Didn't you know that? Hardly anyone's been taken these last few years. They found what they're looking for. Can you leave them alone? Can you leave us all well enough alone? Let me die in the cold, John. Let me forget what a miserable waste I've been. I don't want to go back. They're taking children, Vasily. I don't care. Agent Harkas all sides heavily. Then, I'll have to take you in by force. Stroganov stares at Agent Harkastle for several seconds. Who was Marcy, John? Agent Harkastle moves back sharply. I... I don't know what you mean. Stop it! Marcy Kane, a village girl, who would dance on the moors, practicing for a life you both knew she'd never have. You'd sneak out of boarding school to watch her. I... I don't, don't, please. Your first kiss. You talked of running away together, but your parents found out and you were taken away. You were 17, the last summer of your life. I said I'd wait, but you didn't. You went off. She probably did too, but I can't see that much. The Mars in your head is just a shadow, a shade. A frail copy that only tells a fraction of the story of the original. Why don't you go back, John? Go... God, I'm sorry. Go back... to the fields. G yes, go back. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry. Agent Harkastle collapses, gibbering for several seconds before expiring. Stroganov stares into space, moodily crying for several seconds. I had to. I had to. They'll never get out of my head. They want it too badly. Don't you see? 
Did you know what you did? Stroganov shakes his head and screws his eyes closed. The fist flickers and cuts out. In Lu. You remember Hat Castle. He'd been at Site 90 when you just started out at the Foundation, back in the late 80s. He'd been a mentor to you, fresh from your doctorate and hungry for knowledge. A few months later, he'd disappear. Transferred, you'd been told. Now, he barely existed at all. Not many people left to remember him, and they'll be dead soon. This document immortalizes him, but only as a description of a recording, an abstraction of an abstraction. You light up a cigarette and keep watching the footage. The cameraman is at home now. His mom's clothes are old-fashioned, even for the time period. She looks like a faded 50s housewife, smiling a perfect smile at the camera. Her anachronism is flawed, though, and little bits of the contemporary are sneaking in. The father smiles, short-sleeved shirt, old-fashioned watch, beer can, sunglasses. A man who never thinks he's out of place and always is. You've known these people. They're the same as any thousands of parents who live today. But their past placement still changes them. Alters them. They're not the same. They're too natural to be from back then. You must have been, what, 30? 40? Back in 1976? It's become a lost time even to you. You only remember flashes. A woman smiling. A father laughing. That person you fell in love with. Teachers with strange faces. Grains on old camera footage. Black and white. Color TV. Shadows of shadows. You return to the file. Addendum 4833-2. Recover documents. The following documents were recovered from the personal effects of Agent Valerie Kowalski after her suicide in 1997. They were compiled by her in the course of her investigation into SCP-4833. The text of these documents is transcribed below. Document 1. Copy of a page of an MC&E shipping manifest, detailing goods imported into the USA from 1947. Date. Item number. Item. Units. Price. Notes. 8th of May. SS-13. French Horde. 1. $11,099 Strong amnesiac defect forces the user to forget key aspects of their childhood. 8 of May, SS-14 Copy of book, Visions of the 20th Century, 1940 to 1970 1. $1,120 Non-anomalous, but contains impossibly accurate predictions and photographs known to be taken after its date of publication. 14th of October, SS-15, Prototype Amnesiac Drug, 30, $45,900, taken from SCP Foundation Q facility. 14th of October, SS-16, Bosons, 16, $56,900, possesses a memory restoration effect, experimentation into implanted memories and going. 14th of October, SS-17, Yellowstone Park Visitor's Guide, C. 1970, 1, $20,000, obtained from SCP Foundation Q facility, tag with label, Department of Temporal Anomalies. 19th November, SS-18, documents and items recovered from the Marianas Trench, 7, $101,000, no further information provided by Mrs. Dark. 28th November, SS-19 Wooden Violin 1. $3,250 Non-anomalous, but due to sourcing of the wood from Yggdrasil, is particularly susceptible to anomalous alterations. Document 2. Message from Foundation Facility Q in 1959 2. Director Holloway From Researcher Brown, date, 16th of July, 1959. Message begin. Regarding subject BH-12, little response observed in hippocampus, despite extensive tests. Researchers also concerned about safety of their own memories. Asbestos suit effective 
but staff increasingly reluctant to use due to health concerns. Recommend funding for Gregory's new formaldehyde line suits. Symptoms of BH12 remain constant, complete absence of phone memories, but consistent belief that they are a school child in 1976, despite lack of ability to give accurate information on events after 1954 and ignorance of much of recent history. Ineffective capacities, however, seem to have increased. Curious obsession with exploration of World War II era bunkers recently noted. Observations continue. P.S. Desbert and I once again want to thank you for dinner last night. When can we return the invitation? They dress eager to try her new electric skillet on something really ambitious. Message and Document 3 Extracts from a report of unknown provenance concerning contained anomalies in Foundation Facility Q at the time of its closure, 1968. Anomalous subject 1 is a male, age 19. Subject was incarcerated by the Foundation following demonstration of anomalous memory altering abilities. Subject was anomalously altered at an unknown point in 1966. Subject described experimenters as wearing white carnival masks. Subject is capable of temporal alteration. They can specifically change events which they perceived prior to 1966, but only to a highly limited degree and with minimal alteration to the overall flow of events. Very little has been changed except for the event of a road trip taking place in 1965 and the outcome of a brief romance subject had with his classmate, Valerie Smith, in 1964. Subject is incapable of retaining any long-term memories which occurred after the experimentation performed on them. They believe the year is still 1966 and often believe they are still being experimented upon. Recommend transfer to Site 107 for experimentation by the Department of Temporal Anomalies. Anomalous Subject 88 is a female, age 36. Subject is believed to have undergone significant anomalous alteration in 1949 to a degree that permanently damaged their cognitive capacity. Subject appears obsessed with the Mariana's Trench and frequently talks about it being a sheer fall of the edge of the world. Notably, statements by subject are highly consistent with Subject has an advanced piano playing ability not known to be present prior to experimentation. Subject speaks in an unknown language during all times where the piano has been played. Analysis by linguists has revealed significant similarities to the Algonquian language, especially Potawatomi. O5 Command has ordered subject to be transferred to Site 01 immediately. However, due to dissent from the Ethics Committee over PV section, this order has been temporarily halted. Anomalous subject 212 was a female, whose age at death was 30 years, incarcerated since 1959. Subject's memories are entirely replaced by memories of an unknown 17-year-old school child, claiming to be from 1976. Subject's predictions of events in the last decade have proven to be entirely incorrect. However, claim that events such as the assassination of a President Kennedy and a war between the United States of America and an unknown entity called North Vietnam, possibly related to the third century DAU dynasty, Republic of Hanoi, would occur in the 1960s and 70s. Subject possessed anomalous memory replacement abilities against all unprotected individuals to come within a 5 meter radius. Subject found hanged on 9 10, 1969, shortly before Facility Q's closure and implementation of side system. No note was found, however, a series of pencil drawings of a pilot, a World War II era bunker, and a Super 8 field camera of unknown brand were found in her quarters, having apparently been composed shortly before her suicide. Document 4 Video log of footage recovered from a Super 8 film camera, found in a small cave in Idaho in 1985. Begin log The video opens on an unknown hillside, with a landscape reminiscent of the American Midwest, but with the colors differing significantly from baseline reality, a small settlement or town can be seen at the bottom of the hill. It is reminiscent of many towns in America from the mid-1970s. A large cloud, reminiscent of a vortex, can be seen over the town. 
It is intermittently red and black in coloration. Several indistinct gray shapes can be seen emerging from it and heading towards the town. The camera's movements are consistent with being held by an individual familiar with its use. The weather is, however, causing significant shaking. The cameraman begins to run heavily up the hill. The image here is blurry, and details are indistinct. The cameraman briefly drops the camera. While picking it up, he is briefly visible. A white male in his mid tents, with a violin case strapped to their back. Beyond, a long hairstyle typical of the 1970s. No other details are clearly visible. The cameraman begins to run again. After a couple of minutes, he comes across a cave. A light can be seen shining from within. The cameraman enters the cave. A thin, rose tinted film can be seen stretched across the center of the cave. Crude graffiti which reads, Safe House, can be seen on the far side of the cave, beyond the film. The cameraman lets the camera fall to his side and walks forward towards the film. He switches the camera off shortly before entry. The video opens onto an image of the cameraman, now severely emaciated. He is talking to the camera, but due to localized image distortion, it is not clear what he is saying. His speech becomes increasingly desperate before he turns off the camera. The coloration of the environment is now correct. The video opens onto the hillside, as seen from the cave entrance. The jolts to the camera seem to show the cameraman limping. He is moving towards the edge of the cave and appears to reach and throw up before continuing onwards. The camera is pointed at the former side of the town. It is in ruins, but large scaffolding and construction materials can be seen across it. Thousands of indistinct, but apparently identical humanoids can be seen engaged in construction work. Nobody else is visible. All are wearing identical orange jumpsuits. The extreme weather seen in the early version is not present. The camera is dropped, and the image abruptly cuts out. The camera is picked up. Its angle points towards the town, which now resembles Boise, Idaho, in the middle 1940s. The camera turns towards the cameraman. Their face and hands are now indistinct, and not visible due to image distortion. From what is visible, the cameraman appears to be screaming. The camera is turned off. The video opens on the interior of the cave. Several words can be seen scrawled on the wall in black marker. Synapse. Civilans. Signs. Sayonara. The civil. One word has been circled. Cinco. The camera turns towards the cameraman. They are clearly no longer emaciated. Their face and hands suffer the same distortion, but markedly worse. They are wearing a white Venetian mask. The camera is turned off. There is a place that nobody talks about. It's buried miles under Yellowstone Park, and it's a mystery even to the foundation which created it. It's the only thing which truly terrifies them. The primary purpose of this place, this cavernous expanse of steel and concrete, is repopulation, reconstruction, restoration. But there are things buried in it that have a broader purpose. Scranton reality anchors. The exacts. Other buried machines you know nothing about. Things which alter time and change casualty in ways which are subtle, unknown, unheard. Sometimes, things might fall through the cracks. Smoke cloaks your eyes as you stare into space, deep in thought. You're too absorbed to notice changes on the screen. As the reel churns and churns with sentient pictures, a group of friends, laughing in front of their lockers, talking about some forgotten joke or gossiping about unknown persons. The content is not preserved, only the form of it. A boy, unseen by the cameraman, but in the background of the shot, is seen writing on a piece of paper. His eyes and face are serious, in concentration. He looks up occasionally, twitchy and nervous. Beside him, lies a violin case. You don't see the boy. You've already turned back to the file. He's not a part of your memory. 
that other image of an image of something that might have been real. Was he even really there? Incident 4833-8C On the 26th of January, 2019, a hostile takeover of the abandoned auditorium at high school was initiated by SCP-4833. Foundation operatives swiftly secured the site and quickly ascertained that only a single member of SCP-4833 was present. Agent O'Hara was sent to interview and detain the instance. The following is a log of her personal camera feed. Begin though. The member of SCP-4833, henceforth designated SCP-4833-8, is standing in the center of the auditorium stage. Their appearance is heavily distorted, but their gait, posture and movements are consistent with an elderly human male. They are wearing a white carnival mask and the outfit typical of American conductors of the mid-20th century. They are holding a golden violin. Around them lie a large number of items of clothing. These resemble the outfits worn by orchestra members from around the world during the early to mid-20th century. Hello there. I was wondering if I could have a chat with you for a moment. It's okay. I'm not here to hurt you. I just want to understand who you are and why you're doing this. I... I'm sorry. I don't know what you mean. I don't know of any bunker. Do you mean one of our sites? No, that's not... Okay, look. Maybe we started on the ground foot here. Could you tell me about the rest of the symphony? Your co-performers? SCP-4833 gestures to the clothes around it. They're just... They're only clothes. They... Died? Your kind can... Oh, I see. So it wasn't a plan at all. You faded. You declined. SCP-4833-8 picks up its violin, taking a couple of steps towards Agent O'Hara. The later pulls out a pistol and trains it on SCP-4833-8. Why did you experiment on children? What do you mean? Like you? And the lake? I... what? SCP-4833-8's hands are seen to visibly tremble. It seems to struggle against some unseen force centered on the violin. What do you mean, interpretation? No. There's always a meaning. Sometimes, things aren't hidden behind themselves. There's no other force at play. There can't be. There's just you and your musicians, and the children you did this to. Memory is just another method of recording. I don't know where you came from, but you're as flesh and blood as I. There's nothing mysterious about you, and nothing that made you do this. <laughs> then what the hell did? SCP-4833-8 plays a note on its violin. Agent O'Hara's right arm falls to her side and drops her gun. What? What the hell did? I don't care. You took children. What even are you? I can't see your face. Memory doesn't do that. You didn't have to make them remember. Their lives weren't worth that, and you failed. There is no bunker. There are no passwords or forgotten peoples. You gone your followers into joining you, and they all left and died. Nobody was forgotten. There's only you. History is singular. The truth is singular. You are explicable. What happened to the class of 76 is explicable. I... I'll find it. I'll find the truth. SCP-4833-8 begins to play the violin. A melody beginning with a slow tempo, gradually increasing in speed and pitch. Mm, music doesn't have a consciousness. It just seems... It's not. She didn't want me. No. No. Not. 
It was the last summer. University next year. I had a walkman, and it rained. I asked her after, and she said it wasn't a fight, but, but I remember it differently. Which is the truth? SCP-4833-A is playing is becoming increasingly rapid. They appear to be lurking away from the violin. The hills were green. We were. I used to play the guitar. She played the drums. Her parents didn't like what we were, but that didn't matter to us. We were going to be great. Red sky over the horizon. SCP-4833-A is now playing at a speed and complexity impossible in humans. With a great crunch, they detach themselves from the violin, collapsing to the floor. The violin hovers in the air, continuing to play. What are we? Who are we? Don't you remember? SCP-4833-A is now clutching its head. It makes a distorted sound, believed to be a scream. The violin continues to play at impossible speeds. Don't you remember? Several figures can be seen to appear around the edges of the concert hall. They all possess heavily disfigured faces and are facing Agent O'Hara. I remember. The camera feed cuts out. And lo. Shortly following this, Bakov was able to gain entry to the auditorium. SCP-4833-8, the clothing, the violin, and the disfigured humanoids had disappeared. Agent O'Hara was found fully conscious. Upon the briefing, she claimed to have no recollection of anyone or anything being present in the auditorium. A girl is smiling in a hallway. She laughs at someone her joke her friend is telling her. A teacher walks past, a worried expression on her face. The sun is shining through a window. The picture quality washes the scene in grainy light. The hallway never existed, anymore. This reel was recovered from the bottom of the Marianas Trench, along with a few other tiny fragments, in the dark, buried beyond where any man could go, the only place anything has ever been found of the things that once were. Nobody remembers her. All you see is some light on a page, an image, a shadow of a shade that happens to resemble this creature from long ago. It's not a memory, but a flicker that indicates that something, anything, once, moved there. The reel ends. Its sound echoes through the room. Click, click, click. White and black lines flicker across the screen. And you sit there. Cigarette smoke filling the air in front of your blank face. One day, you will never have been either. Some disaster or trivial catastrophe will happen. And the whole rigmalore will start again. A bunker, a lever, deaths and endings. A movement will end but the symphony will go on forever. And even if it doesn't, even if all fails, your own life will be gone. It will be extinguished as so many others were. You will be a corpse, a skeleton, dust, a thing that never was, and nobody will remember you. The trees will grow over your grave, flowers will dance, humans will linger on, then die, or spread out amongst the stars with no memory of their homeland. The earth will crack and burn, and the molecules will die, and the atoms will die, and the dark will consume them all. What few scattered waves remain will dissipate, and nothing will ever have happened. An infinity with no concept of itself. Or maybe not. You pick up your lighter and burn the documents, watching each leak of flame consume them. You stand up, your face dark against the flickering lights, and walk out of the room. Nothing beside remains. In low. A mystery revealed only to the highest ranks of the Foundation. A memory of a past life. Perhaps your own life. Maybe just an anomalous defense mechanism driving in the minds of a few stragglers. We will explore what lies beneath Yellowstone Park, and we know that certain entities are determined not to be forgotten. In their pursuit of continuing experiments without revealing their true intentions, the Foundation has been overwhelmed on multiple fronts. The only option left is to try to stop them before they decide 
it's best to start anew, without changing a single thing for the best. Help us continue our mission by leaving your comments and suggestions below. I am Virus Trisonimo. We are the GOC, and you have been informed.